Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. I <clears throat> want to thank the organizers for giving the opportunity to be here and to speak today. Uh, when I was sitting there thinking about what I do in Prague when I'm here, I think I've only been here in conjunction with conferences. And I've been here, I think, seven times in the past 15 years, uh, although mostly in the 1990s, so probably so long ago that nobody at all sitting in this room remembers it. Uh, maybe no one was there then. Uh, that's probably the case. Anyway, all of these conferences have had to do with pension reform, which is what kind of binds them together. Uh, in spite of that, I'm not going to say anything about the Czech pension system. I want to talk more in general about uh, pension reform, pension systems, and where I think uh, uh, public pension schemes are moving in the future. So that, that, that will be my contribution today. Uh, <clears throat> so the outline of the talk is trend towards defined contribution, DC, in a pay-as-you-go context, which we now call non-financial or notional defined contribution and in the context of pre-funded or in the, in when it comes to DC, defined contribution schemes. So both defined contribution, uh, pay-as-you-go and funded. Uh, and then the question is why is the world moving in the direction of defined contribution? And I'll try to give you an explanation. Uh, and then I think probably that this is a very general thing. I will then speak very specifically about the attributes of non-financial defined contribution and financial defined contribution schemes. Uh, say something very briefly about the arguments for multi-pillar systems. System then is, consists of several schemes. Uh, and lessons from two decades of reform. Uh, and perhaps it's the, that part which is maybe the most interesting, we'll see. Uh, <clears throat> okay, the move towards uh, uh, non-financial defined contribution, uh, DC pension schemes. Uh, what we see in this context is that uh, we, we have, we, at least we can classify pension schemes as four different kinds of pension schemes, depending on whether they are defined benefit or defined contribution depending on whether they are financial or non-financial. And what I mean by financial is, is pre-funded schemes that in principle uh, are fully pre-funded. I don't mean just schemes that have some funds, but I mean schemes that are really pre-funded. And those are financial because they put their money into the financial market uh, as opposed to the non-financial pay-as-you-go context where you can have accounts also but the money does not go to the financial market. It is noted on individual accounts and goes to pay for the pensions of current pensioners for the most part. But even in those schemes, you can have at least partial funding, but you don't have full funding. There's no ambition to have full funding, of course, in a pay-as-you-go scheme. Uh, and what has been happening then is that we've got this trend, I think, that you can notice everywhere going from in the financial context from defined benefit to defined contribution, in the pay-as-you-go context from defined benefit to schemes that are either uh, non-financial, notional defined contribution schemes, or which are approaching those schemes in their design. So if you look at Europe and if you, in, in a recent, uh, uh, in, in recent work done at the OECD by Ed Whitehouse, et cetera, you will see that, that most of Europe is going in the direction of what we would call non-financial defined contribution pay-as-you-go schemes. I'll explain what I mean by these schemes in just a moment. Uh, but why is this move occurring? Uh, I was just thinking I'm in the process of reading, reading uh, a dissertation for a student in Iceland, and Iceland has a defined benefit, financial defined benefit, occupational scheme, very much like the Netherlands scheme, in case you're familiar with that. Uh, and, and, I, and, and this causes me to think because, uh, and I've also actually, in, in the context of the EU, had a, an opportunity to be uh, to participate and actually organize a discussion about the Netherlands pension scheme about 18 months ago. Uh, and 
it caused these, delving deep down into these schemes actually causes you to think, what did we, what were we thinking about or what are we thinking about when we're thinking about defined benefit financial or funded schemes? Uh, okay, on the surface we say that the, that the employer, if it's an occupational scheme, or the, uh, the insurer, if it's not an occupational scheme, takes the risk. That sounds pretty nice, of course. Uh, the individual or the worker has no risk, the pensioner has no risk, the risks somebody else is taking. All right, so then I, I read my dissertation, this, this uh, doctoral dissertation from Iceland, and I see that the whole history of the Icelandic pension scheme is a struggle to make ends meet. That is to say that there's never enough money Okay, and the Icelandic scheme had the unfortunate, or maybe oh, fortunate, unfortunate, it started up in the 1960s, at the end of the 1960s. What happens? But all of the 1970s was a very bad financial market. Okay, when you design these schemes, you expect some rate of return, of course, whatever it is, but you expect it. You 3%, 4%, 5%, whatever it is, whatever your op degree of optimism is in this sense, you expect it. And so, and so then you define your benefits given this and given some estimate of, of longevity for people who are in the scheme. Uh, and if you, if you really have a defined benefit scheme where people around the age of 20, 25 years are joining and then you've, you're telling me that you, you, it's possible to do an, a longevity or life expectancy estimate for somebody over 75, 80 years. I don't know how many people in the room have been working with uh, with life expectancy models. I started to do it about five years ago with the Lee Carter models, which are supposed to be the state of the art, uh, and it's pretty hard to do it. And if you go back and you take, you take uh, the information that we have in Scandinavia, for example, the, the, uh, for Sweden, which I've worked with a lot, but also for Finland, Denmark, Norway, but even other countries such as Great Britain, the United States, Japan, etc., uh, you find that it's, it's pretty hard to get the Lee Carter model, which is the best practice model, to work perfectly. Of course it works, but to get it to work well enough in order to do this sort of projecting. So we have two problems. It's very difficult to deal with these risks, and I suppose that if I'm the actuary in the defined benefit context, then I'm extremely conservative. I should be, at least. But nevertheless, uh, as I read this dissertation, I found that the Icelandic schemes were in deficit, more or less, at least actuarially so, for about 10 to 15 years. That's a long period. Okay, and then I was in the Netherlands about one and a half years ago. Uh, the Netherlands scheme was not affected, as far as I know, by the bad financial markets in the 1970s, but it has been affected by the bad financial market in the recent 10 years. And if you look at it, the, it's, you can find financial statistics that look good. So if you happen to do things right, you might have succeeded. Uh, but if you look at all of the information about the Dutch financial market, there's no way in the world you could get 3 to 5% returns in that financial market, unless you were really extremely good at choosing stocks. But of course, this is a big business, and, and this is more or less reflecting what is happening in the entire market in the Netherlands and even in the world rather than just specific uh, stock or equity choices. Uh, so it's very difficult to do this. It's very difficult to, to really define a benefit and, and to hold a contract. And as it turns out in the end, well, as, 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 as these system schemes start up, of course it works often because there are not a lot of pensions that have to be paid and there are a lot of contributions coming into the scheme. So it looks pretty good and it's kind of like a pay-as-you-go system in a sense, uh, with, a, with a fund in that case. Uh, <clears throat> but in the long run it doesn't seem to work all that well. Uh, and the schemes have to increase their contribution rates and as it turns out, uh, even if they are employer contributions, which they are, for example, in the Netherlands and in Iceland. Uh, the discussion that I heard in the Netherlands was that our employees uh, cannot afford to pay higher contributions. Note that I said employees, not employers, because what happens is actually they get, these get negotiated back, of course, in, in wage negotiations to the employees. So that I, I think it's been sort of a a scam in a sense to believe that the employers, even though they 
physically pay the contributions are actually doing it at the expense of their profits. Uh, and, it's, and I was impressed to see that even the unions in the Netherlands realized this was the case. And now they're discussing something like moving in the direction of defined contribution for the defined benefit Netherlands pension scheme. We'll see what they do. Uh, perhaps another problem they have is that they've got over 500 funds. One might ask, is that economically efficient? Uh, you've got about the same system everywhere. Do you need to have 500 investors? It's a question you can ask. I asked the question. Maybe the, 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 in the Netherlands they think it's okay, I should say, because there are a lot of special interests, of course, in the end. In, in. Uh, <clears throat> okay, but it's the same story if you look at pay-as-you-go, because there's a presumption that... Uh, that uh, in, in pay-as-you-go anyway, that at least it's, it's over it, that the workers cover the risks of the defined benefit contract, but it's not the pensioners in a sense, so that, uh, so that somehow once I become a pensioner, I'm covered, if it's really true that it's a defined benefit. Uh, okay, so, but even in, even in pay-as-you-go systems, we have the financing risk, uh, we've got, if we mean we've got a fixed benefit, then as, <clears throat> If we've got increasing dependency ratios, everything else equal, which it is, uh, we have to increase the contribution rate. There's no other way out. Okay, this is what countries all over Europe and in part all over the world were doing, have been doing in the past 20 years in order to uh, make their defined benefit pay-as-you-go systems work. Uh, and the longevity risk is, has the same sort of problem because if you really believe that the benefit is fixed, that is to say there's a fixed benefit age, which we've seen lots of countries now have been trying to change this. Some have succeeded, some haven't, but we, we see demonstrations with a million people in Paris because the government wants to increase the pension age because a defined benefit said that 20 years ago that I was going to be able to get my pension at a certain age and then now they're going to change it. So what do you mean, defined benefit? I mean, that's not fair. I paid in, I should get out for the sa on, the, on the same conditions. So I think that the, the, what we're doing now is we're changing the terms of the contract in pay-as-you-go. Uh, but as these defined benefit schemes have matured, then the same problem has arisen, that uh, the only way you can get out of it is to increase contribution rates. Uh, and who pays them? In the end, at latest, future generations of workers. Uh, and so this, this is all a familiar discussion, but it's, it's pretty evident, I think, why defined benefit sounds very good in principle. In practice, it doesn't seem to work, is my conclusion. And I, I haven't seen anything that looks like a scheme that has been working for 40 years uh, anywhere in the world. And this is why I think most 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 countries, uh, most occupational schemes, most, uh, most uh, public schemes are going in the direction of defined contribution. So then what is non-financial defined contribution, financial defined contribution? It's pretty simple. It, it is extremely simple. I'll start out with non-financial defined contribution. We have a fixed contribution rate, and we try to keep it, at least the idea is that it should be fixed for all generations. So whatever it is, you figure it out first what you think is a reasonable contribution rate for the average worker with the average working career, and then you set that and you say, this is what we think will work for all the future. It's possible to increase it, uh, but if you increase it, then you're giving more pension rights. Uh, and these individual contributions, they can be paid by anyone, employer, employee, and even the government, which I'll say something about, are noted on personal accounts. But the point is, is that for every pension right that is granted, there's also some money attached to it, so we know how it's going to be financed. There's a rate of return on the accounts, and this rate of return is the internal rate of return that is required to keep the system in financial balance. That's one of the two ways that the system maintains uh, the fixed contribution rate. The other way is through the life annuity. At the end, when it's time to become a pensioner, which can occur at any time after some minimum pension age, then we take the money on the accounts and we, in the simplest case, divide it by life expectancy for the cohort that I am a member of, and we get my annuity. 
then there are other ways of constructing annuity too, which even has been done in, for example, Sweden and Italy. Uh, but in principle, that, that's the way it works. Uh, and this means then that we're taking life expectancy into account so that at least we're covering most of the longevity problem. But even in this instance, we still have the problem that our, our uh, uh, mortality models are not perfect and it's very difficult to, uh, to predict what's happening and so that, uh, so that there is a risk of some residual uh, miss here. In addition, the life annuity has a rate of return. The rate of return is the same rate of return that, that workers get on their accounts. Uh, so it's the same rate of return for everyone if you do it right, for both workers and for pensioners. Uh, and that rate of return, uh, at least in principle, can be if you have just a notional defined contribution scheme, uh, it can be the economic rate of growth, which is in, in a pension sense the covered the covered nominal wage rate per capita and the rate of growth of the labor force or even decline. So in many countries we expect declines. So we might expect real growth of per capita wages of one and a half, two percent, but in many countries we might, we might expect a deduction on that which would be due to a declining labor force of, and might be equal to something like some uh, uh, 10 to 20 percent of a percent, something like that. Uh, in the worst case, if you take some of the countries in at least the Baltic states, you would probably expect a deduction of about a half percent because these countries' populations, uh, they're, uh, they're not reproducing themselves. And in addition, they're leaving the country. Uh, they are, you would expect something like a deduction of a half percent per year, which is a lot. But then you ask yourself, how do you otherwise take care of it? Because somebody, something has to happen. And so you do this, you make this deduction on both the accounts of workers so that they don't get, if the rate of possible rate of interest is 3% due to economic growth, inflation, and uh, the labor force, the net of that might be 2.5%. Still positive, but it's not as positive as it would be with positive labor force growth. So this is really, uh, emphasizes the importance of having fertility rates that are close to two and not fertility rates that are 1.2, for example. Much of, East, much of Europe actually has way too low fertility rates and should be perhaps more worried about those in a sense than they are about uh, paying pensions because this is a long-term problem. All right, so this is, you have a minimum pension age, I said that. And what is financial defined contribution? This is what everybody in the room recognizes. And they probably thought that's just what I just said. And it is in a sense. There are only two differences really that in the financial scheme, we don't, we not only have accounts for individuals, but the money that goes to accounts also gets put into the financial market. Uh, of course, that's a big difference, but that, that is, it's a difference. Uh, and then you get the financial rate of return, and that's what's most important for me as a pensioner. So then, and when we create these, the financial schemes, we hope then that we're going to get a better rate of return from the financial markets than we would have with the, with, from economic growth. Uh, we haven't, at least looking at the st as Swedish statistics, we have, as you have here now, a, a small mandatory uh, public financial defined contribution scheme, which has actually done worse than the notional defined scheme in terms of rate of return in the past 10 years. So it's not, it's, it is not a, a given fact that it's going, that the financial scheme is going to perform better. And the worst thing about Sweden is that instead of investing money in Sweden, which in, in principle, you give the recommendation, do not invest your financial money in your own country because you want to diversify, diversify your risks, of course. We don't want to have all of our risks invested in the Czech Republic. Okay, so, and so the Swedish setup is very liberal and so most of the money has gone to the international financial market, which actually did worse than the Swedish financial market. The, 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 but uh, in, in, in general, the Swedish financial market follows, of course, like every other market, the rest of the world, so that there's not a big difference, but there was a bit, enough of a difference because there's a different uh, di difference in the, in the composition of what is, what is important in Sweden. Um, 
Okay, so that this is then, these are the, really the only other differences, but there is one economic difference and that difference, and that is that you're putting money into savings and you might claim that these savings will help economic growth. Of course, the burden of the proof is on the person who says that because you, ma you have to manage to channel these, this money into, to, into modes of creating economic growth. And from what I've seen in countries throughout uh, Europe anyway that have uh, introduced financial defined contribution schemes, they've put most of their money into government bonds. Uh, and it's not so clear to me that putting your money into government bonds is the best way to develop the, to develop the private economy. Uh, it, ha it is very indirect in that case. Maybe you're investing in infrastructure and other things which help. It's quite possible you can argue that. But, uh, but you're not putting your money into direct investments in any sense if you're just financing the government debt. And if you're doing that, I would hope that you're doing it in the sense that you're financing government investments and not public consumption, because that doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, but, and I think that this is what has to be thought about, because there is a case, Chile, for example, started out by putting money into bonds, and I think there's even evidence that the Chileans managed to develop the mortgage bond market by doing this, so that they actually did something which was useful in an economic sense. Uh, and they also did a, a, apparently a wise transition uh, that was financed. Um, so it is possible, uh, but it's not so clear that the countries, at least the ones I've seen, have been moving in that direction. So it, uh, the next question is, are you really getting out of this what you thought you would when you were advertising for it in the beginning? Okay, so that, uh, I don't know, I've got a slide here with some uh, comparative rates which some researchers have take, come up with, and they're not particularly impressive, but what they do say is that uh, financial markets tend to do better than the, 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 in the, than the national economy, uh, which I think we've always known. If any, I think any study that you do over the past 50 years, even in Sweden you can do it for the past 100 years, you come up with the easy conclusion that the financial market outperforms the economy. But then, as I said, tw during 20 of the past 40 years in Sweden also, past 10 years plus also in Sweden, the 1970s, uh, the financial market did not outperform the economy. Uh, and so this, is, this has to be taken into consideration when you're, when you're thinking about these systems and thinking about what you want to do with the money, etc. Uh, and there are, I think, much better ways of investing money for large funds than, than uh, there are funds doing that these days in any country. Okay, the, there are some very important features of defined contribution schemes which I think are worth noting because if you're an economist like I am, that's one of the main reasons why you like defined contribution schemes too. I don't like the idea that the defined benefit schemes do not hold their promises actually, so I think that that, is, that kind of erodes trust in government. How can you have trust in a government with a defined benefit scheme that does not fulfill uh, the promise of a defined benefit. And so this just creates a lot of controversy and in some countries like France that a few million people go into Paris and have a party for a day. And it, uh, so that you, you, I don't think that that's reasonable. But you, okay, individ, individual accounts give transparency. It's clear what my, what my claim on future consumption is. It's exactly what I've got on this account. Uh, you might, if you're a politician, you might say, "Woo, do I really want to tell people what it looks like? Uh, does it look that bad or whatever? Uh, but maybe this is the whole point, that you are straightforward with what the system promises. So it is transparent. Uh, it, is, it, it gives intragenerational fairness. If two persons contribute the same amount of money in the same year, they get the same account value or the, the same claim on future consumption. That's a pretty good aspect. There's no tax wedge in, in, built into the system anyway. Uh, there are many tax wedges usually in all of the defined benefit schemes and most of them very untransparent. Uh, intergenerational fairness, if you want to define that, is that all generations pay the same percent of GDP to their pensions, then it is intergenerationally fair in DC. Uh, you have an opportunity to create transparent social policy with, with def 
in these defined contribution schemes. This is also not only NDC, but FDC, uh, because even though there's no distribution within the system, it's up to the government. If the government wants to uh, cover, for example, periods of, uh, in conjunction with childbirth, which would then mean uh, transferring money into the accounts of women, and according to some rule, which there are many possibilities for, uh, in creating child rights. And you can do this both in financial and in, in the pay-as-you-go or non-financial context. This has nothing to do with financial, non-financial. It has to do with the fact, that the, the fact that there has to be money put into the scheme in order to pay for these uh, benefits that you, in the future, that you've promised. Uh, but you do this, you can also do the same thing with, uh, with insured periods of sickness. It means that the sickness scheme puts money in for the persons who are sick. You can do it with insured periods of unemployment. It means that the unemployment scheme should put some money into your account for that period to cover that. Uh, you do it with disability, and so you connect disability to these schemes by that doing that instead of creating some other special benefits so that, uh, so that I get my disability benefit according to the same formula as the one that applies for my work. And the disability scheme is putting money into my account in order to make that work. Then, of course, the government has to figure out what that means in practice or the insurer. Uh, but that's the way you do it. And uh, so it makes everything very transparent. And it also makes sure that you pay for what, you, you pay for what is promised. Uh, with these account schemes, you can share accounts very easily between spouses and legal partners. You can share accounts uh, between partners before they become pensioners, and you can create joint annuities very easily after they become pensioners. And the, the advantage of this, of course, is if you think of normal survivor benefits, at least in the, in the public domain context, the normal survivor benefits often mean that persons who are not married transfer pers money to persons who are married. And you ask yourself, what, what is, what's the logic behind that transfer? Uh, and that's the way it works in many countries. It works that way in the U.S. is the survivor benefit. It's been criticized for the past 40 years, but nothing has been done about it. Uh, that's the way things work, too, in practice. But at least people are aware that that's happening, and they think that, in principle, it's not right. And so you, if you do construct this sort of a system, then you can take that into account, and you, can then, you make the transfer between persons within the partnership or the couple. Uh, and you do this, you can do this both in financial and notional schemes. Okay, there are macro features of DC which are very important. One is uh, financial sustainability, which I claim that you do not necessarily get with defined benefit schemes. Uh, and it's achieved, as I said, through the internal rate of return. In a financial scheme, of course, that you get whatever you get from the financial market, and that's what determines it's the, the system is in, in is stable to begin with. Uh, and in the notional scheme, you have to do it through the internal rate of return. Uh, <clears throat> you integrate longevity directly into the pension formula so that you people can see what happens as the society ages, then it is obvious that, that people have to work longer or get lower pensions. So it's part of the message. Either work longer or get a lower pension as we, in principle, become more healthy and, and uh, live longer. Uh, <clears throat> and then if, you, uh, if you're going to, uh, let's see, legacy cross commitment. Well, if you're going to compare now the options of NDC and FDC, then you would say that the financial, if you want, if you just today want to put a system on the country, then you can get a longer transition period out of an ND scheme. You still have a transition, I should say. You can get a longer transition out of an NDC scheme than you, have, than, than you will out of a financial defined contribution scheme. In addition, you can make it very explicit and uh, within the accounting system. Uh, labor supply incentives, there's a direct link between contributions and benefits and defined contribution schemes, both NDC and FDC. There's no tax wage, as I just mentioned, uh, so that uh, you can make the claim that you're getting what you pay for. 
And in many countries, this might be a good reason to pay your contributions instead of being in the informal labor market. At least, and you can even, the politicians can use this as a vehicle to say that, well, if you're not going to be paying your contributions, you will, be, you will expect to get, at best, a very, very minimal guarantee pension. Uh, so it's your choice. It's not, it's not the government that made the mistake. It's your own choice. You made the mistake. You did not pay your contributions. Uh, whether that works or not is a question. It doesn't seem to work very well in Latin America. Latin America has had financial defined contribution in most countries now, some of them, Chile, for example, since uh, early 1980s. And the degree of informality in Chile is about the same now as it was 30 years ago. Uh, we, I think, have some evidence that maybe a country that the only one that I've kind of studied is Latvia, that it actually has worked in Latvia, but then, of course, other effects might be working too. It's pretty difficult to separate out just that effect. Uh, but, uh, but on the other hand, it's neutral, so it, it, does not, uh, it does not hurt anything to have a direct contribution between, contr uh, uh, the direct link between contributions and benefits. Uh, there are even political economy, potential political economy advantages to, to define contribution. Uh, the logical framework many claim is very saleable. The idea that you get what you pay for, many people can understand, that seems reasonable. Why not? I mean, why should somebody else get more and I get less for, what I, for the same amount of money? Uh, and it's, I think, reasonable for most people to think that uh, if people are getting healthier, living longer, then it's reasonable that we work a little longer too. And maybe at the same time, we're entering the labor force later. And so maybe the number of years we work is not much greater, but we're kind of changing this period of work or it's moving towards higher ages. At least that's what seems to be happening. Uh, so but there, really are, there are two messages. You get what you pay for and that uh, which can be very strong, um, and that it's reasonable to work longer or postpone retirement uh, for, for cohorts that are born later and later in time because they're going to be much more healthy and live much longer. Persons born today are perhaps expected to live to the age of 100, uh, so we shouldn't be planning our pension systems to cover all the mistakes that we made in the 1950s. Uh, we should be thinking about what's going to be happening in the future. Uh, <clears throat> NDC can be moved towards FDC, but it, that creates some transition costs, but at least it's possible. They have the same, they have the same uh, design in, in principles, so you can move from one to the other. Uh, I would say that in practice, it's, I, I, for me, it's pretty important that countries do what they've promised. So if you set up system X, I think you should stay with that system. You shouldn't be changing it. Uh, you might have a strategy for change to begin with, but then that should be explicit from the beginning, how you're going to do it, how you're going to finance it. Uh, but not just to be doing things all the time. Uh, so I think it's important because I think it's important for populations to, have, to be able to have trust in government. That is to say that they tell us what they're going to do, they do it, they don't change it. Uh, and then you think about recent events in this respect for when it comes to pension funds in Hungary, for example, and even in Poland and even in Latvia and a few other places. Uh, so I think you want to do things, if you, if you have to have this sort of vision for the future that you don't want to fail within the next 10 years because you are too anxious to do something now uh, and you maybe were too optimistic when you did what you did. So I think there's a good reason for to be very careful in doing all this stuff and to do it right. Uh, that is to say, the answer is not to do it, the answer is to do it right. Uh, <clears throat> so that uh, anyway, these, uh, these, these schemes can be integrated is the final message. So the, there are some arguments for multipolar systems. Uh, these defined contribution scheme or schemes have to start out, they have to have some sort of a bottom, they have to have some sort of a guarantee. Now most countries have a guarantee anyway of some form, uh, but they have to have a guarantee. And the guarantee can either be a flat rate, which I 
not many countries have chosen, but Russia has done something like that. It's more expensive and maybe not as good. Uh, or you can have a, a top up to the, to the defined contribution pillars. So that means that you get less and less, uh, the better your other pension is. Uh, then you have some, then the two defined, perhaps a, a pay-as-you-go NDC pillar, and then you have a financial defined contribution pillar within the public scheme. Many countries have gone in this direction. Uh, as I just mentioned, not all have succeeded very well, mostly because of over-optimistic or, uh, I'll talk about it in just a minute, but not, not preparing it very well. Uh, and then, of course, there's the question of whether you have a ceiling on the public commitment, which many countries do. Sweden has a relatively low ceiling, which provides an opportunity for occupational schemes and even private, uh, private insurance schemes on top, of the, on top of the ceiling for the public scheme. Uh, <clears throat> and this opens then the opportunity even for defined benefit schemes in case you nevertheless uh, disregarding everything I said, like to have those. There is a, a purpose for some defined benefit schemes, and it is for persons working in special conditions, etc., who perhaps cannot work until the age of 70 or 75. Uh, and in those occupations, maybe there should be some sort of a defined benefit uh, supplement in order to help them out earlier. But then it should be paid by, of course, whatever the production process is for this, uh, uh, for whatever they are doing. So that I'm just going to show you an illustration which I happen to have in the back of my, well, in my computer, uh, which shows four countries, uh, Italy, Latvia, Poland, and Sweden. All four countries have an NDC scheme as the basic scheme. If you look at the beginning of the diagram, you see that it's rather flat for three or four countries. It's flat for Sweden, for Poland, for Latvia, because there's a guarantee in the beginning, so you cannot get less than a specific amount. In Italy, there's no guarantee, so that in Italy, the line goes more or less, uh, the, the guarantee in Italy is a means-tested allowance instead, so they have it. Uh, and then otherwise, uh, I think for me the most important part here is that the, the black line that takes off into the air is the Swedish line because the Swedish line also has above the, as, as a supplement to the NDC scheme and above the ceiling there's also a financial component and the financial component according to the OECD models and assumptions which we're using here, uh, the financial component gives a better rate of return so it gives uh, uh, a better pension and the Italians then, you might say, are paying much more for less pensions than the Swedes are, if this diagram is correct. Of course, that presumes that the rate of return in the financial market will be greater than the rate of economic return. Uh, the Italians get a very good replacement rate, but they pay a lot of money for it. Uh, <clears throat> Frequently committed blunders in pension reform. That's, this is where I'm going to end up. Not quite sure how I'm doing with time. I don't have a watch. It's okay. Okay. Not sure whether I should speak faster or try to find some more anecdotes. <laughs> okay. Uh, pitfalls in reform. I think probably the greatest pitfall that has occurred in the past 20 years in reforms, particularly in Europe, but also in Latin America, it's more or less where you find reforms, uh, is the failure to estimate the financial legacy and transition costs and to follow a predefined strategy. So uh, the financial legacy is what happens if you go from a very expensive defined benefit pay-as-you-go scheme to an NDC scheme because you're going from an, an indetermined, undetermined contribution rate to a fixed contribution rate. Divine benefit doesn't have a determined contribution rate, and so you have, to, you have to figure out what are we doing in this change? We do a change and we have it, the change affects different cohorts differently. What is that going to cost? Are some, we're going to give people what we promised them from before, uh, and that's the legacy, but then we're changing the system into a, a DC system. So you have to compute this legacy. Uh, to my knowledge, no country has done that. We did that in Sweden. We uh, kind of did that in Sweden, I should say. We, I was a part of doing it, so we, I should say that we tried to do it in Sweden. 
Uh, but then the next, the next question is to, to get this into the minds of politicians. It's very difficult. Uh, so that it's not to say that, it's, uh, that it is impossible. What it just says it's very difficult. But if you do it by the book, you have to, you have to compute this legacy because otherwise it's going to come back and bite you in the future somehow. So to just to use my own country, Sweden, as the example, we introduced NDC, we did, we did estimates of what it would cost, we took into account the legacy, etc. cetera. Uh, Sweden, fortunately, but in a sense, unfortunately, well, fortunately, I should say, had a very large fund within the pay as you system. At this time in the early 19, uh, in the mid-1990s, Sweden was interested in join, joining the European Union. At that time, we thought that the rules of the European Union were to hold, so that, uh, and, and I guess they were for entrance at that time, but once you got in, it was free to do whatever you wanted to do. But uh, anyway, at that time, Sweden then was trying to get its, its pretty high debt down because Sweden had a, was hit by a tremendous recession in the first four years of the 1990s. GDP decreased by 10%. Uh, but benefits did not decrease by 10%, so essentially we borrowed money to, we, we did decrease benefits, but not by 10%. Uh, and we borrowed money in order to keep things on an even keel. And so, and then the, the, after that we worked and have still been working very hard to keep the debt down. So now we have one of the lowest debts in Europe. Uh, but uh, in order to help this debt reduction, some of the money was taken to, to uh, cash in m many of the government bonds in order to get less debt. So we took money from the pension scheme uh, and we had one estimate, persons working on the pension scheme, the Ministry of Finance had an, another, another idea because they were mostly interested in getting the debt down, at least the invisible debt, and uh, so that they, they took more money than they should have. And, and so we, if you were optimistic, then you'd say, well, maybe it'll work anyway. Uh, but now that we've had the two, 2008 recession, we saw that we didn't have enough money. Uh, and so the NDC system says that we reduce benefits a little. And so this is then what I say that, okay, it doesn't hit you immediately maybe because the 1990s were pretty good years and even some of, uh, in, in economic terms, uh, up until 2008, we had pretty good times and then we had bad times and it hit us a little. But we followed the rules and so we, uh, have decreased, so wages went down too by about 4% or so for a year, at least the wage some did, and we also, we also uh, reduced pensions according to the NDC formula. Uh, anyway, so if, if the right amount of money had been left there, because one of the problems was that the money was there actually to pay for the baby boomers born at the end of the 1940s and the, and the early 1950s, and uh, so this was, so that the whole idea in, in producing that fund was actually to use it to pay for this. So even Swedish economists and politicians, I think, were very forward seeing, looking when they thought about this in the 1950s. But then the Ministry of Finance needed some money to, to trim our debt. And so we, we lost part of it. Uh, I think all this is important because maybe you can do that, but then you've got to have some sort of compensating mechanism. You can't, cannot come back and say it's the NDC system that has done this because actually it was the political decision that was made 10 years earlier that was the problem. But nobody remembers the political decision. Nobody knew about it. Who knows, I mean, what kind of advertising you get for moving money from one government fund to another or reducing the money in another fund. Anyway, so that that, that then not to use other countries, I've used Sweden as, as an example. Uh, transition costs, I think that there, if you look at what, hap what has happened in Hungary, um, especially I know quite a bit about what happened with the Hungarian reforms. And even though there was some talk about thinking about the transition cost of the financial defined contribution scheme in practice, the Hungarians were not following what they thought they should do. Uh, and probably because of over-optimism, rate of growth, et cetera, was pretty high for at least in the beginning of the, the 2000s, everything looked pretty good, and then all of a sudden the recession, the recession came and they got hit, and then a new government came that thought this is a good source of money, uh, the pension funds, so why not take it? Uh, and I think that that was a really bad decision because it has a lot to do with trust in government, as I said. People were 
committing themselves to this idea of having pension funds. The pension funds seem to be working at least as well as pension funds work in general. And uh, so it's, I mean, it would have been better not to have done it than to have done it the way Hungary did it. Let's put it that way. Uh, so failure to develop the adequate technical support. So many times politicians think that all we do, we get together, we have some good experts, the politicians have good ideas, we create the system, let's implement it on the 1st of January next year. Uh, okay, this, this is, it's not to say that this may not necessarily work, but the thing is, is that you've got to have the technical support to make it work. Uh, and the best example of not doing it well is, is, was the introduction of the funded pillar and, or even the, the NDC pillar, but it, it had the most uh, repercussions on the funded pillar in Poland in, in 1999 because it took Poland the director of the Polish ZUS said, of course we've got it covered. We've, got every, we've always got everything covered. We're that good. All right, and so they didn't have it covered. They couldn't keep track of the contributions. Companies tried to pay their contributions. Uh, they, they just couldn't make it work, and it took them three years to make it work, and they lost a lot of confidence in the pension system and probably the Polish government and everything else. And that was really unnecessary. They could have waited a year, for example, and tried to put everything together and make it work better. Well, the Poles learned that, and, and hopefully that lesson is a good lesson for many others, too. In Sweden, it took, it took us actually, we, we spent a lot of time introducing our schemes, and it took us uh, two years to go through the computer, re redoing all the computer technology because we took advantage of the opportunity of a new pension system to do it. Uh, but we did everything from the beginning with modern technology. And then when it came to the financial component, we, it took us an extra year because we contracted a company that did something we didn't like, and so we said, we can't do it this way. We'll have another, <clears throat> we're going to have another way of doing it, and it'll take us another year. But it was good that we did that because it, it worked. And the, and the thing that worked, which was actually very cheap and in-house an in-house product was also saleable to other countries. Uh, okay, failure to create a universal system. Countries like to, because of political reasons and pressure, leave out different various groups and say these groups can, will forget about the farmers. But of course the problem is, and once again alluding to Poland, that the farmers are 20% of the country, but in 20, 30 years they're not, not going to be 20% of the country. So there's going to be this rather rapid transition from farmers to, to non-farmers, non-farmer workers and why not have them also in the same system? Uh, I know that there are examples of countries, uh, is, I think Germany is an example of a country that leaves out the farmers, uh, and then you have a special thing for the farmers, but at least in Germany these days they have a stable system, a stable farming community, I would guess. Uh, but I, the, the idea of a uni truly universal system, I think, is best. Uh, one of the other problems is that uh, off sometimes arises that government does not follow its own legislation, so that the Italians did not do that with their NDC scheme. Uh, they had, and the Russians have not done it with their almost NDC scheme, so that they, <clears throat> so that they legislate changes and changes benefits according to changes in life expectancy, but the government doesn't want to do it in practice. So they don't do it in practice, and then they don't get the benefits of this, and then all of a sudden they've got a big problem because the problems have been piling up year after year after year because they haven't been doing it gradually. Uh, and this is in, in December of last year, the Italians finally straightened everything up in the pension system all at once. Uh, all of these things, of course, undermine trust in government, so that there are a lot of side effects of not doing this the right way, because it's, it, it's just not good. You want people to have trust in government uh, in, every, in, in the institutions of the country. Uh, okay, so there's some specific pitfalls for NDC, and this also has to do with FDC, but the, it's the, and if you're going to do a reform, try to try to communicate very well the, the logic of the reform to the public. So the public has to buy into the reform. Otherwise, the reform is not going to have its expected uh, results. That is for sure. And uh, 
The other is that uh, the new entrant only model for an NDC scheme does not work very well because it, uh, the new entrants are very few people compared to all the persons who are already there. So that the Italians started with a new, an, an NDC scheme for new entrants, uh, as have many other countries and a couple of countries in Central Asia, but nobody knows they've got an NDC scheme because for the most part, most people don't, are not a part of this scheme. And it would be the same thing for a financial scheme. If, if most people are not a part of it, then it, it, they, there's, no, uh, there's no sense that this is our scheme. And the, whatever the incentives that this scheme should provide are not going to be there. OK, so some countries forget that it's a good idea to present information to the participants so that they know what's happening, especially when you have account schemes like the ones I'm talking about. It's very important to then show transparent individual in information, but also to show information on how the system is functioning. Uh, and it's also important to set a minimum pension age, which is reasonable regardless of what your system is, so that you don't have, you don't allow people to be able to take a pension so early that they're going to put themselves into poverty. And this is an argument against off, uh, where many countries in many parts of the world have thought that uh, women should have pensions five, ten years earlier than men, for example, so pension ages of 55 for women and 60 for men or whatever, something like this. The women live, what, five, six, seven, eight, nine years longer as widows if they were married and they've got, they leave the labor force with a bad pension, which looks okay in the beginning because they still have a husband or a spouse. The husband or spouse dies and they go into poverty. So that you don't want, you want to figure that one out from the beginning. Uh, maybe it's not so important in this country, but it is important in general. Even financial defined contribution schemes have pitfalls. Uh, so I've already mentioned insufficiently financed transitions or the not following the transition that you, strategy that you said you were going to follow. Uh, actually, many countries in Central and Eastern Europe, the ones in introducing funded pillars did not follow their strategies. And that's, that's why they ended up, to a large extent, with the problems they had. Uh, you can also have poorly thought out new entrance rules and the, uh, and the opting out or opting in system, the first ones in the United Kingdom. So people with, who should not have been opting in were opting into systems, into the financial systems, and it was pretty easy to show that they were actually getting a bad deal. And you don't want that. So you want to know that it's, if people are opting into a system or out of the, out of the pay-as-you-go system, into the funded pillar, that they're actually going to be getting something which is good for them. It's better than the alternative. Otherwise, they shouldn't be doing it. Uh, failure to utilize economies of scale. Many of these financial schemes cost way too much. They cost way too much because just because uh, economies of scale are not utilized, that they're, they're run more or less like traditional and Insurance companies, see, instead of having one collection or contribution collection, <clears throat> maybe one clearinghouse for information and accounts, because really what is necessary is to use the what is important uh, for the market. What is important are investment skills and the skills to create and maybe uh, provide annuities through an annu annuity market. That, that's what the insurance company is supposed to be good at. But accounting and stuff like this, maybe you can centralize that and save some money, and especially collecting money. Uh, there's, there are some good benchmarks around. There's even a Swedish one that has, uh, that it's for, <clears throat> anyway, the TIA CREF in the United States has something like three or four million participants. They're mostly professors and college teachers and employees. Uh, and they run the system on 15 basis points. It's a financial defined contribution scheme. Looks a little otherwise like the scheme that I think that you have just entered, are going to introduce here, where you can choose among a very small number of funds, but there, there's only one fund, one provider of these funds. Uh, so that, uh, and, and if I look at the Swedish market, I don't know what, the, what things cost in this country, but if I look at how private insurance uh, runs in Sweden, it's pretty easy to get up to about 10 times this amount in basis points in private insurance. Uh, and maybe it's arguably okay, when it's, especially when you're providing individual insurance contracts, because then you're providing some sort of a special service for 
for an individual. Uh, but if, you're, if you've got this mass production of pension products and, and investments, then uh, why not try to hold down the basis points? There's even an example in Sweden of one of the occupational schemes that, that there's a private company that runs it also for something like around 15, 20 basis points. So it's not impossible. Uh, and I think it's important to take this into consideration. Uh, another problem is that oftentimes governments introduce too restrictive regulations for investments uh, and sometimes poor investment designs and strategies. Uh, and all, I think most of the countries I've seen that start up systems like this have no idea in the world what they're going to do when the annuity phase comes. Uh, there's, and even, even if you look at advanced countries like the United States and Australia, you ask, there are academics asking themselves, where are the annuity markets? Uh, we economists say the annuity markets will pop up. They'll be there. Uh, the United Kingdom has annuity markets, so they have popped up there. Uh, but it is apparently not so easy to get them to pop up, and uh, there might be reasons for that. And it, uh, it's important that the annuity markets work well if you're going to do it that way, and so that people's pensions are also good as a result, of course. Uh, and it is probably the case that in starting up a system, when it's, you cannot have a market if you've only got a thousand pensioners, of course, or a few thousand pensioners, which you would have in the beginning of a system. And so there's a, a pretty good case for having a, an annuity monopoly until the system gets big enough until you can spread it out into a, an annuity market. Yeah. Okay. I think that's about all I'm going to say. What I do want to say is that uh, I have just produced together with Robert Holtzman and David Robolino uh, an anthology with uh, 24 chapters, 58 authors, 900 pages about uh, progress, lessons, and implementation, gender, politics, and financial stability of NDC schemes. So that this book is now available. And I think that's all I want to say. I will. I hope I didn't take too much time now. Nobody stopped me. So. <laughs> Thank you.